everybody and welcome visiting students and families. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Maisie Jefferson. I'm a senior at Gordon this year. And I have the opportunity to introduce our chapel speaker today. While being part of the Presidential Fellows cohort this year, I know my fellow fellows and I have been so blessed by the chance to work closely with and get to know President Hammond. In every conversation I've had with Dr. Hammond, it's been so easy to see his heart for Christ and how that shines through in his heart for Gordon and its students. In other more specific conversations, it's been just as e easy to see his heart for baseball stadiums and lemon donuts. As the rest of my co cohort can affirm, ever since his inauguration my sophomore year, I'm sure I'm not the only one who immediately noticed how intentional he is at building community and engaging the campus. Not only by posting and advertising student events and achievements on his story, which has become quite the social media achievement, um, but also by his eagerness to make connections, form relationships, and actually spend time with us um, and join us on our journey through college towards Christ. It's been such an unexpected highlight um, of my time at Gordon to have a college president who values good discussion, whether it's about campus life, random history facts, or a mutual dislike for theologically incorrect Christmas songs. <laughs> so please welcome to the stage President Hammond. All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it, again, welcome to our visitors. It is great to have you here. And um, uh, many of you have probably been here. Is there anybody who's here for the first visit to campus? First time you've ever been here. Oh, this is great. Yeah, well, a special welcome to you. Um, and we get to come together uh, three times a week for chapel, but it's, it's not the only way that we live out our, our calling together. It's not the only way we uh, pursue Jesus on this campus. It's one of those special moments when we can gather in this room together. Uh, but the, the, the worship team here, uh, part of uh, the catacombs, what long tradition on Sunday nights. Uh, love catacombs, love being there, entering and exiting quietly. Uh, so many worship opportunities on campus, the TDR worship that started up, um, men's and women's ministry, so many great ways to get involved. And, uh, and there's more coming. So, so we're just thankful to be at a place where um, it's not an afterthought, it's not an add-on, it's not something we say, oh yeah, right, we're, we're also a Christian college. No, that's the heart of who we are. And so happy to have you all with us today to, to celebrate in chapel. Um, and I, I was thinking about how to, um, to, to speak to everyone today. And as we wrap up kind of the, the year in the next month and a half or so, um, I, I was really just reflecting on what is it that God's calling us to? What is it he, he calls us to throughout our lives? And, uh, and so I, I um, was doing some reading and came on this theme of childlike faith. So we're going to talk about childlike faith. Or I also thought you know, it could be kind of witty. And, and so the, the subtitle would be Kids and Birds and Politics, which will make sense in a moment. It'll, it'll all come out. But it's really this, uh, this difficult question that we have in our society today. You know, what is it that the Lord requires of you? What is it that the Lord requires of each of us as we live out our faith in public life today? So for our scripture, we're going we're gonna to look at Matthew uh, chapter 18. We're going to start with the first five verses. Then there's a couple other passages that we will get to in a moment. Uh, so this verse, very familiar uh, episode, if you remember. It's in uh, two of the other Gospels. This, uh, this, this moment when Jesus is interacting with the disciples and and it was a common question that the this, this disciples would ask. We have different moments in the scriptures where they say, uh, okay, Jesus, I, I get all this stuff you're teaching, you know, on, this, uh, on the mount and the sermon you gave us, but uh, more importantly, when do I get to know where I'll be in the kingdom? Or how do we inherit the kingdom? Or, you know, when's the good stuff going to happen? And, um, and so this is one of those episodes where the interruption was the presence of little children. And then and another account, the children are sort of in the way. Matthew is a little more polite about it. <laughs> At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in his name welcomes me. Now, some of us, we, we, could, we could probably agree in this room uh, that little kids 
are, um, are, are basically annoying, right? Um, I say in this room because I, there's probably a couple little ones here. Just do your coloring page during the sermon like you do at church. Um, but uh, I've heard it said that all kids are annoying except your own kids. <laughs> so there's that kind of uh, rule here too. Um, and yet at the same time, uh, joking aside, there's something so pure and innocent about childhood. And this is what I think Jesus is trying to show us uh, with this, this really strong admonition. It's not just saying, well, here's a hint. Be kind of like these kids. It's a really clear admonition. Unless you become like one of these children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Very strong. But kids, uh, maybe my sense that they're annoying is because kids rely on care all the time. They need some kind of caretaker, a parent, someone to, you know, when they're first born, uh, someone to take care of every part of their life. Um, and uh, my wife Jennifer, who's here, um, and, and I together equally raised six children. Don't laugh. Uh, we, we shared responsibilities, but Jen was an amazing mom. And, and there's something beautiful, actually, about um, children coming into the world. I see Brian Lane over here. It's coming soon, Brian. Excited for you. Um, and, and, and yet, those, that, that small child needs you to provide every piece of their existence, everything that they need for life. So to be like a child is to be totally reliant on others, totally reliant on some other strength, some other... Uh, f uh, ability that can provide for you. That dependence, when we think about what childlike and childlike faith means, built on a dependence, a need for, for parents, not built on our own achievement. Um, I've never seen a baby handing me his or her resume. Uh, I've never seen a baby's LinkedIn page. Please don't go start one. Um, I've never seen a baby who's you know, kind of in the, 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 the go get them business suit, riding the T, going downtown to work in finance. Uh, these are ludicrous thoughts, of course. And yet, childlike faith, and to be like a child, is not to be totally coddled or immature either. Um, some of you have read the book, it's been out now for almost 10 years The Coddling of the American Mind. It's a fascinating study of our current culture today, and the fact that um, college age students, your generation, is, is really the focus of the book. And, and the authors take to, to task the fact that in our culture today, there's been such a sense that, that your generation is so weak and feeble and fragile that you can't handle tough ideas or tough parts of life. That's not what childlike faith is talking about. It's not calling us to be immature or to be incomplete in our thinking or in our, our growth and development. The whole of Scripture points to the importance to be mature as believers in Christ. And so childlike faith is about dependence, but not immaturity. Second thought is it's about innocence. Think back to the Garden, the Garden of Eden. Think back to the way we were all created. Created innocent, created in fellowship with, with God. Walking in the morning hours with God himself, Adam and Eve. Think about that purity of innocence that comes for, from a child who not only can't function for themselves, not only doesn't really have an ego or a pretense about who they are, but they really don't have a sense of right and wrong. They really don't have a sense of, of what they're called to do, that innocence. Third thought is that to be like a child is to, to, to really be steeped in curiosity and wonder. The idea of curiosity, we talk about that here sometimes, of, of having curiosity and skepticism together, of being, being skeptical sometimes to ask hard questions, but being curious to pursue the answers around those. That curiosity that drives children to ask sometimes an incessant amount of stupid questions, uh, but to, to explore, to wonder, to ask why. That idea of wonder that's wrapped up in what it means to be a child. To pursue the faith with an element of wonder. Abraham Heschel was a Polish rabbi born in 1907. And he escaped the Nazi regime, but many of his family were killed by the Nazis. 
And after going through that, dealing with the deep hurt in his life, he became known for focusing on the concept of wonder. Heschel said, wonder rather than doubt is the root of all knowledge. Wonder rather than doubt. He also said our goal in life should be radical amazement. Get up in the morning, look at the world the way that takes nothing for granted. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. Never treat life casually. To be spiritual is to be amazed. Think of this rabbi and what he went through in his own personal life, and yet calls us to this concept of amazement and wonder. How much more so should you, as a child of God, redeemed by Jesus Christ, take on that sense of wonder and curiosity about the world? And especially about those things of Jesus Christ. Wonder's a, a childlike, sort of a wholesome approach to the world. To be in awe of discoveries. To, to be curious about new ideas you've not thought about yet. And to understand that Jesus has given you a mind, a heart, a body, so that you can explore the world around you. And yet, like a child, that sense of wonder and curiosity takes a safe environment. Good boundaries, good understanding of how you explore the world. Now, like some of you, I, uh, in, in the middle of the pandemic, found myself locked down at home for a few months. Um, and like some of you, I discovered some new hobbies. So I want to share one with you because for me, this is uh, how I recaptured some sense of wonder during the pandemic. So we lived, we didn't live in Massachusetts at the time, but we lived in a, in a house that had a woods behind it. And we had these bird feeders that we would put out, and I didn't think anything about it. Yeah, the birds, okay, fine. Again, my attitude about kids and birds maybe isn't the best sometimes. But then I thought, okay, I've got all this time on my hands and I'm working down here in the kitchen and everyone's home on their laptops doing their schoolwork. And so I filled these bird feeders up and I started to think a little bit and all of a sudden I start to see some birds come in. One thing led to another and over the course of the, the months at home, this beautiful blue jay, you could just see the detail. I didn't even have a great camera, but I was this close in our, in our back porch to some birds. And, and got to just capture on film some of these amazing birds that came just to grab a quick bite, grab a quick snack. Uh, the rose-breasted grosbeak, the cat bird there. This is a, a, called a red-bellied woodpecker. Just such a beautiful, vivid crown on this bird. Um, the, the pileated woodpecker, which is a really large bird. You can see it here. You can see the tuft of its head. Even caught a, a little hummingbird, which is really beautiful. Probably of all the pictures, and, and, and again, this was just a short time while we were locked down. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, uh, the, uh, no stereotyping here, but the, the female is the one on the, on the top of the picture, <laughs> and the male is the one sort of recoiling in fear. So, <laughs> it's just nature. I can't control it. Um, but I love those Orioles. And, uh, and the beauty of, of, of the, these birds. That sense of wonder was, it was, made such an impression on me at the time because the truth was that those birds were always out there around us. And what drew some of them in was changing the kind of feed that we put in bird feeders, um, just in case you know, uh, to attract Orioles. It's a seasonal migration of Orioles, but you can use um, orange slice. They like the color orange, of course. And so if you slice oranges and put a little jelly in a, in a little tray, they'll come. So keep that in mind. So you may not care about birds. I know some of you have told me that birds aren't real. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, government conspiracy of sorts. But uh, you may say, okay, who cares about birds? Fine. The point is this. This sense of wonder, the sense of childlike curiosity is something that God has built into us and is part of our faith. It's part of how we should approach the throne of God. It's how we should approach these ideas about what it means to be in the kingdom. It's part of who he wants us to be as we, uh, as we learn, even in a place like Gordon, a place that has good opportunities to, to grow and learn and explore new ideas and take on new 
wonder. I'll also just give a quick commercial. On April 18th at 9 a.m., the Ornithology Club is sponsoring a guided bird walk. 9 a.m., April 18th, meet at the trailhead behind Frost. Hope to see you there. Okay, wonder. So this is great. And I know you're sitting there going, okay, fine. So we need to be curious like little children, ask a lot of questions. Somehow birds are part of this. But what, what is the real point of this, this lesson here? The, the point for me is actually thinking through more about what the obstacles are to childlike faith. We've all been children for the most part, right? Unless you just spawned uh, somehow. Um, and so we might think back to our childhood and we can think back to what it meant to be curious, to explore, to discover things for the first time. And yet the reality is that it's more difficult to live that out in a world that's so torn apart by contentious ideas, by differences of opinion, by, um, by deep insults that we aim at each other from time to time. So I see internal and external obstacles to living out childlike faith. Internal, first of all, is our own ability towards self-reliance. And again, as you read the scriptures, I think of verses like, lean not on your own understanding. And uh, for by grace you've been saved. It's not of yourself so that you can't boast about this. It's a gift of God. Our self-reliance will get in the way of a childlike faith. Our ability to think, and especially for, for you students, at this moment in your life when Every day you're getting closer and closer to getting more credits earned and better grades and opportunities for internships and you're building that resume. It's easy to rely on yourself. An internal loss of innocence. We talked about the Garden of Eden a moment ago. Remembering that in, in chapter 3 of Genesis, God goes to see Adam and Eve and he finds them hiding because they're ashamed of their nakedness. And they hid because their innocence had been lost. For some of us, the obstacle to childlike faith is indeed sin in our lives that we've not laid before the throne. Sin that keeps us from being able to approach not only the, the scriptures and, and in our prayer life with a sense of wonder, but even to be able to explore the world with that sense of curiosity. Because sin is dragging us down. That sense of innocence lost makes it so difficult, as Jesus is pointing to, to enter the kingdom of heaven if you don't have a childlike faith. I think cynicism, cynicism that's born out of the realities of, of, of our internal criticism that we aim toward ourselves, cynicism that comes internally when we deal with external criticism and pressures and bullying from others. The external side then, I do just see this rise every, it seems like every day, in verbal bullying. And I'm not just talking about our campus, but in some ways I am talking about our campus. The worst of it is anonymous posts on social media that drag people through the mud, that aim verbal daggers at the hearts and minds of your fellow classmates. And before I come down too hard on our own community for crossing these lines, understand that you're only mimicking what's being modeled for all of us in our national dialogue and in our international dialogue. Some of you know my first job out of college was working on Capitol Hill in politics. I care deeply about politics. I have very strong opinions about politics. I'd love to talk politics with you sometime. And yet the reality is our national political dialogue has fallen so short, not only of, of what we would aspire to in the faith, but of what we would aspire to from a basic bounds of civility and integrity. It falls so short of respectful dialogue. We're going to talk about this throughout this year, this presidential election year. How do we as people of faith enter into that dialogue? And I'm not critical of politics because I... I would come down in the place that would say, avoid it at all costs. It's important to engage in politics because our political atmosphere in this country, in this world, needs people who are redeemed by Jesus Christ. Who are willing to tackle hard questions. Who aren't afraid of engaging in civil dialogue, even with those with whom we might disagree. Not because they're motivated by a lust for power, 
but because they feel like it's a responsibility to bear witness to truth in the world. These make it difficult to imagine a childlike faith. And yet to wrap up, I go back to the words of Matthew 18. Verse 6, after that passage we read before, if anyone causes any of these little ones to stumble, uh, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Give Jesus credit. He could paint a word picture. (laughs) And yet when we think of those little ones that he's pointing to, literal children around him, That's each of us as we treat our brothers and sisters. How do you treat one another? How do you honor one another? How do you respect one another? The cynicism, the hardness, the the, the loss of innocence is often provoked by criticism, by mistreatment, by the way that we uh, don't respect one another. But the good news is, to, to use some more verses out of this chapter, Chapter 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. You may have a criticism of another person. You may have a disagreement with another person. You may even believe that it's your right, somehow justified, to to make that public. And again and again, what Jesus calls us to is a harder pathway, but a pathway that is indeed more loving to go personally to that person, to share with them from your heart to theirs what it is that you see that you disagree with or that you see that might be sin in their life. The reality of the the, the social dialogue that we're dealing with in our culture today is because most of us are too cowardly to live out this one verse. To love someone enough to go to them personally and to share with them what you feel like you may be seeing with humility so that they may be won over to the truth. And at the end of the chapter, verses 18 and 19, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This isn't just confronting to, to show someone how bad they are or how wrong they are. This is because with the power of the Holy Spirit, as we point toward truth and we do this in love, Miracles happen. You can be released from sin. You can regain that sense of childlike innocence, a sense of wonder. And again, verse 19, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it'll be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. We invoke that verse a lot when we pray together, when we agree together, and we should. But note that this is in context of how we deal with each other when we don't necessarily agree. I can't ignore this in the center aisle, this beautiful little girl. How are you? Object lesson right there. The childlike faith that we're called to isn't just so that we can gain the kingdom, but it's the rich reward that we have to submit ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, to allow our sin to be taken away and to allow innocence to be restored. That's worth celebrating. Please bow with me in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for the way that you work through your word, through our relationships with others, through your church, through this place, Gordon College. We commit to you a desire to be more childlike, to be more curious, to have wonder in our lives, to pursue you with that sense of of idealism and to know that you were always there. Thank you for each person here, Lord. Pray for the students as they wrap up this semester. Pray for those visiting today that you would continue to reveal your plan for their life. Help us to celebrate together, we pray. In your name, amen.